English. Um, thanks for coming. It's uh, nice to see such a good turnout. I've actually been traveling around quite a bit the last few weeks, and I've given a few talks and presentations of different styles, so hopefully my voice, my voice holds out and it goes coordinated, but just bear with me. There's quite a lot of slides, but I do tend to go through them fairly uh, rapidly, so I hope that at the end of it, it's a coherent message and everybody gets it and nobody falls asleep. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll start. I work for on a thing called the Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program, based in Sumatra, Indonesia. That's not a legal entity, that's the name of a work program. I'm employed by a Swiss organization called the Paneco Foundation, but within Indonesia, my office is in the office of an Indonesian organization called Yayasan Ecosystem Lestari, or the Sustainable Ecosystem Foundation, and we have about 90 full-time staff spread around uh, nine or ten different locations and field sites around the place. So it's not just uh, a few people, it's a whole team, and it's very much a, a Swiss and, and Australian and everything it, with partnership with Indonesian organizations and Indonesian individuals doing, doing the work. So let's get started. Who is this Ian Singleton guy anyway? Well, I was a zookeeper. I worked, started in 1989 at Jersey Zoo in the Channel Islands near France for a, a guy called Gerald Durrell. And that's where I really started working with orangutans on a daily basis and have been doing so ever since. Um, yeah, that's a good one. This one I would like to dedicate this talk to an orangutan called Gina, who I worked with for many years there as well and sadly died. Uh, very recently, but she reached 53 or so years old, so she didn't have a bad innings. But um, she's incidentally the mother of Cluet. And when Cluet, the orangutan at Adelaide Zoo, was born in Jersey, I was his keeper. And so I named him, and he's named after my, my research site, which I'll mention later on. So there is a connection there. <coughs> <coughs> so when I was a zookeeper, I would uh, try and get out to Indonesia now and then and try and see orangutans in the wild because I wanted to know a bit more about them and what they did and how they, how they worked. And then I went to a few conferences now and then as well and started to meet people and eventually had an opportunity to leave the zoo and go into the field full time. I spent two years in the peat swamp forests of Suak, which is a very wet and pretty horrible environment for people but paradise for orangutans. I studied the ranging be behavior of orangutans and just how far they went. So I essentially patrolled the study area and every time orangutans that we knew uh, from within it were leaving, I would try and go with them and survive for as many days as I could without any food or sleep and living in pretty rough conditions like that. And that's why I'm so skinny. <laughs> but it's actually a very beautiful location in some places. The peat swamps are pretty spectacular at times, which makes up for it. So what's the Samaritan orangutan? Well, once you get down to it, the apes are all very similar, just like the bonobo, chimpanzee, and gorilla. The orangutans are great ape. Um, and I always draw attention to the fact that the only difference between these guys and the humans on the right there is that humans wear glasses. <laughs> <laughs> there are two types of orangutan. Two species now are recognized, the Bonian orangutan, Pongo pygmaeus, and the Sumatran orangutan, Pongo abeli. They used to be considered subspecies, but nowadays they're considered distinct species. And the one on the left is the ugly one, which is the Bornean orangutan. Very dark skinned, very crappy beard, not very pretty. Uh, whereas the, the beautiful, handsome, good looking ones on the right there, the Samaritan orangutans, with these beautiful golden beards, uh, long flowing hair, and everything else. So there, is a, there are physical differences between the species. And there are also ecological differences as well. Borne Borneo is much like Australia, it's a very ancient island. The soils are very low in nutrients. It's all been leached out. And productivity in the forest in Borneo is not as high as it is in Sumatra. <coughs> Whereas in Sumatra, all the soils were kind of laid down 74,000 years ago by the Toba eruption, the biggest eruption <coughs> ever known on planet Earth, even bigger than uh, Yellowstone, even though the Americans sometimes refuse to, be belie to believe me. But there are behavioral differences because of this and, and the strategies they use to space themselves out because food production is much lower over there than it is in Sumatra. There can be a higher densities in Sumatra. Because of that, they can be a bit more sociable. And because they're a bit more sociable, they have more opportunities to learn things from each other. And so we end up with cultural differences as well. And, and the, one of the interesting things about the peat swamps where I was was that we'd, we'd always known from zoos that the orangutans are way out there as the most intelligent and inventive tool users in, in captivity, but nobody had ever seen them doing that in the wild until we went to Suat Belimbing and we found them 
uh, making and using tools on a daily basis. You see just on the bottom left, uh, using a stick to get honey and using the stick to get the seeds out of this really hard uh, mesia fruit. So there are cultural differences as well. Different orangutans doing different things in different places just because that's what they, they've learned from their, from their mother or their, their peers. We've also been doing some research recently into the genetics of the Sumatran orangutans. There are a number of orangutans that we've obtained, rescued pets and everything, but we know exactly where they came from. And so we've been able to start looking at that. And we're getting some interesting things. We've, we found that there's, there's this population in the far south, what we call the Batancoro. And it looks to that that, I'm, I'm no expert in genetics, but in terms of mitochondrial DNA, it's very distinct from the orangutans north of Lake Toba. And, but it's also just as similar as it is to the Bornean orangutans, as it is to the orangutans north of Lake Toba. And it's beginning to look like it's older as well. So there may well have been a population of orangutans from Lake Toba all the way to the south of Sumatra, from which all Bornean orangutans and all northern Sumatran orangutans have descended, so the remains of the ancestral uh, orangutan population. If that was ever found to be a species, and, and there's not enough evidence for that right now, but it would immediately be the most endangered great ape species in the world, way, way more endangered than the, the mountain gorilla. There's only three or four hundred of them left. This is what they look like, again, this handsome, handsome, good-looking Sumatran orangutan. <coughs> so what's their status in the wild? If you fly from the east side of Sumatra to the west, you fly over this thing called the Losa ecosystem. 2.6 million hectares of pretty much pristine primary uh, forest. The problem is most of it's very high altitude. You can see that from here in this very steep undulating terrain. And there are no orangutans in this picture, and there's no tigers and rhinos and elephants because they're all in the lowlands. And once you actually take out all the really high altitude stuff there, you're left with a distribution map, something like that orange pattern <coughs> over on the other side. And that's pretty much where the elephants and tigers and rhinos are as well. Maybe the rhinos a bit higher up in some places. So the Sumatran orangutan is a critically endangered species. Uh, the Borneans still listed as endangered, but declining very fast. Uh, latest published estimates are around the seven, 8,000 mark, something in that, in that area. And as of uh, a conference, the International Primate Society conference in Hanoi, uh, about 10 days ago, uh, the, orangutan, the Sumatran orangutan is now back on the list of the world's top 25 most endangered primates. Now, sometimes people say to me, you know, especially in, in Indonesia, 7,000, 8,000, what are you worried about? So I always remind them that Manchester United football stadium seats 80,000 people. So all the Sumatran orangutans in the world would sit easily in the seats just behind one doll at one end. <coughs> so next time you see William Rooney taking a penalty, just remember that all those spaces behind the goal could be all the Sumatran orangutans in the world. <laughs> this little map shows a green boundary. Now that's the area I mentioned called the Losa ecosystem. And I'm trying to remember that because I'll come back to it later. But you can see very clearly there that the vast majority of Sumatran orangutans are living within that Losa ecosystem area. Now, it is a protected area. It was established by presidential decree in the late 90s, ratified by uh, ministerial decree. And then as of about four years ago, five years ago, it's now also a national strategic area for its environmental function. So its protection is required under Indonesian national law, which is an important point to remember. But it's quite clear that if we lost, if we lost that Losa ecosystem, we'd be pretty close to losing the Sumatran orangutan uh, very quickly afterwards. <coughs> it's also in the province of Aceh, which I'll, it's hard to sign, but there's a line that goes up from about here vertically, and that's the Aceh border. Aceh, remember, was the worst place hit by the tsunami in 2004. So most of the orangutans in Sumatra are also within the province of Aceh. What's the biggest threat? Well, pretty much this. It's, it's loss of the habitat. And the biggest driver of the habitat loss in the areas where the orangutans are is the palm oil industry. It's large scale. It's not just little farms here and there. It's entire landscapes, tens and tens of thousands of hectares as far as the eye can see. So you can see on the top left, on the top right as well, that sometimes these areas are chopped down in a piecemeal fashion. So it's very easy to to imagine orangutans, gibbons, or other wildlife being isolated in these little fragments and, and doomed unless we can get them out of there. 
And you can also see on the bottom left that even mature plantations, whilst they look green, uh, they don't really contain any wildlife. There's, there's very few birds and reptiles and mammals living in there. Maybe a bulbul, and then there's a snake and a rat, something like that. That's pretty pretty big. <coughs> Why is this a problem? Well, it's obviously because everybody keeps on buying it, and that includes me, and I'm sure everybody in the, in the room has some palm oil in their house somewhere. It's in foods, but it's also in a wide range of cosmetic, cosmetics and other things as well. That's what the palm looks like on the bottom right. It's like a miniature ho coconut. So the palm oil itself comes from the yellow husk bit, and the, the white bit in the middle is where you get the palm kernel oil from, just in case you're wondering. Now the problem is, is that <coughs> this is the big problem. Yeah? To get to a palm oil plantation, you have to go through this stage. So a company will get rights to 10, 15, 20,000 hectares, and then it will go in there with its bulldozers and its field staff and start chopping it down. Uh, and, and whatever's left, they'll just burn, burn off, this, off the, re the remainder. And I've deliberately gone in there to see if I could find any living creature. And it's hard. You can't find a grasshopper living in these areas or a lizard. You might be lucky and find a spider if you do some time. <coughs> but that's the important point to get, is that everything that was living in there when it was a forest, everything pretty much, is gone. It's all dead, annihilated. There is no, some of it survives and no it doesn't. It's all dead. And if there is later on wildlife living in the plantations, it's almost certainly not the original wildlife that was there. It's moved in from somewhere else or it's crossing that area, passing through, or it's struggling to survive there because there's nothing else to eat. So where do all the apes go? Well, they all go into the cities, don't they, just like they do in the movies. By the way, the, the actress who plays this orangutan here, Molly, <coughs> is now a good friend of mine because I met her a few years ago. But ten years ago, she didn't know what an orangutan was. Uh, in order to play this role, she spent hours and hours, weeks and weeks and weeks, sitting in front of the glass with the orangutans in Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle, and now she's a passionate orangutan conservationist. So I always tweet and share everything she puts up there. <coughs> <coughs> so the orangutans don't go anywhere else. They stay there and they die. They, they, either, they may be lucky. They may move into some adjacent patch of forest if there is one. But these forests are usually already full, and there's only so much food to go around. So even those ones are going to starve, get malnourished, and, and eventually die as well, or somebody else's. Often they're deliberately killed, and this is a classic example. The one on the bottom right had petrol poured over him and was burnt alive. The one on the bottom left is probably being chopped up to be sold as meat in Borneo somewhere. So this is what happens. They all die as well. So what are we doing? We try to do many different things, and I hope you'll get that idea at the end of the talk. But one of the things we started doing back in, in 2001 when we began was to start rescuing illegal pet orangutans, and we have a center where we can re reintroduce them. This is what they typically look like, either in little cages or with chains around their neck or something like that. And sometimes when you say this, everybody goes, oh, the poor thing. Yeah? You've got to remember that these are the lucky ones. These are the ones that are still breathing. These ones, if, they, if we can get them out of there, get them rehabilitated, these ones have a chance of a second life in the wild and maybe reproduce them and helping to found a new population of the species. The unlucky ones don't make it that far. But they're also refugees. I mean, the definition of a refugee is somebody whose homeland is no longer available to them. And that's exactly the case with these illegal pets. They, nobody's going into conservation areas, national parks, to capture illegal orang little orangutans for the pet trade. There's, n there's no point in that because there are all these refugees uh, around from the forest loss. They're refugees from forests that no longer exist. <coughs> now normally we don't see the mothers of these animals or other orang orangutans killed. We just see the infant and we try and do our best for them. Occasionally we do get called out uh, to try and deal with an orangutan that has been beaten up and captured and dragged off to some village. Uh, and this is what they typically look like, in very, very bad condition. The one on the bottom left, you can clearly see her entire body is swollen up like she's done a hundred rounds with Mike Tyson. Um, but another key thing I've been trying to get across with, th with this slide, a orangutan, an orangutan like that male in the corner there probably weighs around 110 kilograms. <coughs> He's been carrying his body weight on his arms every day for 15 hours for his entire life. So his arms are incredibly strong, at least five or six times stronger than a human, at least. He's also got four hands. 
you try and wrestle one of these guys, even the little ones, it's like trying to wrestle an octopus. You can't get them off. Their teeth, even in six-year-olds, are sometimes their incisors are as big as the end of my thumb. Extremely powerful animal. <coughs> if you ask one of the zookeepers from the zoo here or the vet, could you get that adult male orangutan, transport it 15 kilometers to a village and tie it to a tree without the use of anesthetic? Never in a million years. You wouldn't have a hope. And yet people in Indonesia are doing this on a, on a regular basis. This male was actually captured in a tree and taken 20 kilometers and tied to another tree in the village without any anesthetic or anything else. Now the point of that is, try and get your head around the level of violence that that needs. That needs half a dozen people, if not more, souped up on adrenaline, you know, like this mass hysteria thing, in order to have any hope of achieving something like that and getting away with it. So these are people in, in killing frenzies that are doing this. There's no other way you could possibly manhandle an animal like that. <coughs> Here's a little, a couple of pictures of just uh, some of the rescued orangutans we've got. This is a little chocolate who came from a place called the Trico Peep Swamps where we've been doing a lot of work. Again, I'll mention that. But he's also, he was named Chocolate because there was somebody trying to stop and buy some chocolate when we, when we heard about him. But he's also the only orangutan I ever met that didn't want any human contact whatsoever. We had to drive him across uh, the island about eight hours overnight, and there was me in the back and Santi, and he didn't want anything to do with us. He preferred to just sit on the seat on his own in the middle. He'd lost all faith or trust in, in, in anybody. He's doing well now, though, doing very well. And this is a little, little orangutan that's often on Facebook and stuff, uh, Gokong Pontong, who, for some bizarre reason, his owner shaved his head. <coughs> But he also comes from a, a, a palm oil plantation area. We know exactly where he was captured uh, in the Trico Peep swamps. Most of the orangutans we get are illegal pets, but we are also now increasingly uh, having to go out and rescue some wild orangutans, the ones that are isolated in these little forest fragments that are being chopped down. There's also some areas of mixed agroforest rubber areas that orangutans have survived in since it was forest because there are still some of the original tree species there. Uh, but even a, a lot of these areas are being chopped down now because the palm oil is more productive or easier money. Um, but this one happens to be owned by the head of the Indonesian Palm Oil Association as well. So he's supposed to be the flagship, you know, the shining model of the industry and yet even he is killing orangutans on a daily basis. He lives near me in Medan as well. We don't like rescuing wild orangutans. It's dangerous. It's logistically very hard. Um, um, costs money, uh, but it's also risky for the orangutans as well. The first thing an orangutan does when you dart it in a tree is climb higher, and then no matter how much you try and get the net underneath, there's always a chance it's going to hit a branch on the way down and bounce three meters to the left, or it's going to land on a, some piece of bamboo that's sticking up and go straight through its abdomen. So it's a risky business. But in some cases, we know that if we don't go and get that animal, it's going to be dead within a couple of months. And so we do it. When we get illegal pets or rescued orangutans, we take them to the medical clinic we have, which is just an hour outside of the city of Medan. Um, we have medical facilities there. We have isolation cages because they have to do at least a 30-day quarantine period. And then once they've got through that and they're medically fit, we start reintroducing them to other orangutans again in the socialization cages. And often that's the first time they've met another orangutan since they were captured and they their mother was killed. But that's where they learn to be orangutans again, not just hairy people. And that's where they start that process of rehabilitation for eventual release. These are just a couple of pictures of the, the keepers, all local staff working there. Every orangutan we receive has a heavy parasite load, but that's fairly easy to get rid of. Most of them, apart from that, are okay once you can get a, a decent diet into them. Um, and occasionally we have to do some surgery or more invasive stuff. Every orangutan as well, we, we give them ID chips, transponders, we give them a tattoo, we take photographs of their teeth and everything else for ID purposes. And the numbers, the numbers that we're getting is not going down. And I think if you look back, orangutans have been rescued and rehabilitated in Indonesia now since the early 70s. And the numbers haven't gone down. If anything, they've gone up. And in Sumatra, they may be just about to go up quite significantly more. <coughs> but this is despite the fact that they're on the TV every week and they're in magazines every week and in the newspapers all the time. It hasn't really made any difference whatsoever to what's going on out there. 
And one of the biggest reasons is because there's a total lack of law enforcement. <coughs> if you measure, if you count all the reports from the rescue centres, all the orangutans rescued in, Indo in Indonesia since 71 is probably about 2,800 animals at least, of which I know of three prosecutions, even though it's very clearly against the law to capture, keep, store, sell, trade, own an orangutan in Indonesia. There just hasn't been the law enforcement. We've, there have been three cases. There was two in 2010 in Borneo and one finally in Sumatra in 2012. But this is a high priority for me because it's, it, the law is not acting as a deterrent against these people who are killing orangutans or capturing orangutans, and we have to change that. So a, a, a target of mine is to get at least a few cases each year and get them highly publicized in the press so it does start to become a, a deterrent. Once they've gone through the rescue centre, they're fit and well, they know they're orangutans again, that's when we move them off to the reintroduction centres we have to start that process. We've been reintroducing orangutans in Jambi, way down in the south of the islands, about a 30-hour drive uh, since 2003. We've now released over 160 there and still going. Um, we have decent facilities as well, but this time right in the middle of the forest, and that's where we start to really show them how to eat termites and ants and all those kind of things. And we've now started another site up in the far north, in the little red dot in the north of Aceh there, a place called Janto, which is a very beautiful site and fortunately has this river which we can usually wade across. So that keeps the orangutans at one side and the, sh the staff facilities at the other so we don't have orangutans trying to raid the kitchen and steal bananas all the time. <laughs> so it's a very handy little river there. <coughs> we also have pet elephants and tigers roaming around there quite a lot. Here's a few pictures just to show you what that looks like. Orangutan called Monkey in a, a large fig tree just next to the tank there. <coughs> and then this one I like to show because I like it. Uh, when you go there, uh, occasionally when I get to go there and spend some time and you look into the trees and you see these orangutans up there and they're behaving like wild orangutans and they look down at you and they have no interest in you whatsoever. And you realise that the first time I saw this orangutan it was chained to a chicken shed covered in fungus and with maggots coming out of a hole in its neck. And you feel that you're achieving something. You know? All those meetings and reports and proposals and all that other stuff, maybe it's actually worth it. You know? So I still get a kick when I get up there and see the, see the orangutans doing well. And this is just a tree at the back of the cages. And pretty much every orangutan goes straight up to the top of there when we release them. They never seem to lose that, that confidence in the tree. <coughs> We don't just let them out and that's it. We have teams of field workers there following them, nest to nest, collecting data, and they collect the data in the same format as we would with a wild orangutan study, uh, so it's all comparable. We've been trying to develop these telemetry chips, which would make life a lot easier. Uh, it's, it's proven a difficult and slow process, mostly because we're, we're all distracted with many other things, but we now have the technology <coughs> in a little chip, but the, the packaging that we're using keeps breaking. It's in ceramic casing produced by some vets called Vienna in Austria. But I'm trying right now to get this technology into a much more uh, tough casing so that we can uh, really use that to full effect. At the moment, we still have to go into the forest and look for the orangutans without eyes and ears, uh, and then follow them from there. And if we could use this, it would be a, a big help. But we're close, but we're not, just not quite there yet. And we've also been working on drones. Uh, there's a couple that we have, the Maya on the right and the Octocopter on the left. And we've been using these for field surveys and stuff, but we really hope that within five or six years we might be able to detect the chips, the telemetry chips. We might have telemetry chips that work, and we might also be able to detect them with drones. So then if we can do that, then we can say every three weeks or three months we can survey 20,000 hectares of forest and know exactly that Johnny and Billy are still wandering around and presumably fit and well whereas Margaret is exactly where she was three months ago and probably not doing so well. So I think we're close to getting there with this technology, and that will rapidly, dramatically improve our, our ability to monitor the animals close release, but we're just not quite there yet. But the drones are interesting anyway. We've been using them a lot for survey work uh, in development. They're not very expensive. I'm sure there's people here who've been dabbling in this technology as well. But you essentially just program your flight path and your altitudes and your waypoints, and then you upload it into the drone, and off it goes, essentially takes two years to really get it, so, so that it comes back. <laughs> but uh, it does work, yeah, it's just not, it's not as simple as it says on the tin. I mean, you, you do have to put in a bit of work to figure it, to get the hang of it. But they, they have a good range now. We can 
we can film and photograph things that are like 30 kilometers away from where we can park the car. And that's been very useful in Shifa because we've been taken from company support, which I mentioned. And in the old days, we were easily able to drive past the security and just wave hello, and then nowadays we can't. But we can still see exactly what they're doing everywhere. It is just a, because it's, because we're at a university, I thought I'd throw in a few technical slides. So this, you can do anything like this. You can do quick, quick looks, and you can follow geographical patterns, and you can do grid systems very easily. Um, you can even see an orangutan in a tree if you're lucky. <coughs> if one's eating a palm, count an elephant and things, piece of tape. This is, they've been using this as well in, in, in India. Is it the Kasiranga, where they have all those Indian rhinos and the really long pampas grass? Counting those from a, a Land Rover is almost impossible. Fly over with your drone, you have one, two, three, four, five, three. Yeah. And on the bottom here, we can even detect uh, nesting turtles on the beaches. <coughs> this is the type of thing. So as your colleague of mine as well has also been trying to look into uh, surveying orangutan nests. Currently, if we want to know orangutan density, we go in the forest and we count nests on line transects and we interpolate the density of nests to the density of orangutans, measuring out how many they make in a day and all those kind of things. If we could ever do it with the drones, that would be a huge uh, advantage as well. <coughs> and in order to do that, he's been dabbling with uh, image recognition software to try and see if he can do that. I see loads of uses for this. I see, I see drones shooting rhino pointers places in Africa in a few years. I, I would like to film that rather than rangers having to risk their lives to do it. Yeah. Um, I'm now going to go to back to Aceh and the orangutans and talk a bit about the, the place called the Tripa peat swamps. <coughs> Tripa is up there on the left side of Aceh. You see right in the middle there? Uh, Cluet, you'll notice, named after that peat swamp just further south where I did my PhD. And the reason I'm so interested in these is because your average orangutan density in Borneo is about 0.81 per square kilometer. In these peat swamps, it can be as high as 7 or 8, so 10 times higher density than you would find anywhere in Borneo. So I always refer to these peat swamps as the orangutan capital of the world, a really important place to stay. They're also very important for other reasons. They're, they're huge carbon stocks. The Indonesia, peat is essentially the scientists, I mean, they're, they're the Peat is essentially leaves and seeds from birds and insects that fall out of trees and into the water and they don't decompose because there's no free oxygen there. And so it just accumulates. And it accumulates over thousands of years and essentially you end up just accumulating layers and layers of carbon. And there's way more carbon below the ground in these peatlands than there is above ground in the biomass and the trees. To the point where Indonesia has 56% of the world's tropical peatlands. And the experts will tell you the amount of carbon stored in those areas is between four and 16 times what's in the atmosphere today. So losing these peat swamps is not just a problem of losing a few orangutans. This is, has major implications for, for all of us. This is Tripa back in 1990. It was around 60,000 hectares of primary peat swamp. Uh, it contained around 3,000 plus orangutans. Then in the early 90s, uh, some concessions were handed out. They chopped down some of the forest. They planted some of what they chopped down. Other parts they didn't. 2000, we had a situation like that. But at this point, kind of operations ceased in these areas because the civil war in Aceh, a civil unrest separatist movement really took off and people were running around killing each other. And so plantations effectively stopped functioning during that time. Farmers also stopped farming their farms next to the forest because they were too busy looking after their families. And, and so there was a relative period of you know, five years or so of relative stability in the forest sector in Aceh. In 2005, this was already a, a national strategic area, the yellow boundary. After the civil war, after the tsunami, then the peace accord the, with the separatists, people going back to business as usual and, and, and chopping down the forest at an alarming rate. Just note this little L-shaped bit in the middle here, this little funny thing. There was no concession there at that time. Actually, there was in 2013, so it's just a bad image. We were sat there looking at Tripper, and I've always wanted to try and get, get it back and get these plantations out of there. I never thought it would be possible. <coughs> but then the Indone in Indonesia's president announced a moratorium on new concessions in primary forests and peatlands in May 2011. 
And that was a response to a billion dollar pledge by the Norwegian government to help Indonesia reduce its carbon emissions from deforestation and degradation. As part of that, they produced a map of all these red areas which are off limits to new plantations. And then the governor of Aceh province handed one out a few months later. And we thought, can't do that. And so we decided to challenge it. And ourselves and a few other local NGOs uh, filed a suit against the governor and the, the company in the law courts. We started to amass <coughs> evidence and make sure it got to the right people. The, the little slide on the right shows that 10 months before the permit was handed out, the company was already chopping it down and had a huge canal there and there were already fires there. So breaking the, very blatantly breaking the law, but this is business as usual. And then just after we filed the lawsuit, there was a whole rash of fires throughout the Chitter Peak Swamp, not just in that one concession, but many, many others. These are not small fires. These are large, deliberately set fires. But it's illegal to use fire to clear forests in peatlands. It's totally illegal in Indonesian law. So we were filing this, this challenge against this little company. And we were getting it in Facebook and in Twitter. And we were getting it in the national press like every day. We were getting it in international media. We got it on BBC, we got CNN, SBS, uh, Guardian on a regular basis, Sydney Morning Herald, everywhere. And we started to get a lot of attention. And we got all this information onto the desk of the national government in Jakarta as well. And we also launched a petition where people would sign, everybody who signed that petition, an email went to the, the president of Indonesia, the governor of Aceh, it went to the ambassador for Europe, the Norwegian ambassador, and all these different people. And then they start to get fed up and they start picking up the telephone call and saying, what are we going to do about this? This is making us look bad. This is embarrassing. Do something about it. Who's in charge? <coughs> and as a result, we ended up with the government of, of itself. We, we ended up winning that first case. That, that little plantation was cancelled very early on in this process and is still cancelled. It was appealed and the, the, the appeal was rejected. But because of what we did and the attention we got, we now have the Indonesian government itself taking all of those companies to court. Not just one of them, but all of them. And the case at the top there is the same little company, which uh, in February was ordered to pay $11 million compensation to the state and to spend $23 million restoring that concession to its former condition. They're appealing that, but we're very optimistic we, we will win that and see that through. As of a couple of weeks ago, July the 15th, number three, the director of that same company was put away for eight months and his manager was put away for three years. And there are all these other cases going on against the other companies as well. So we, we, are, we are making some progress and we've, we've achieved some great things here, but like I say, from massive international pressure. This is the guy on the right there, the director, the one who's just got an eight year, eight, eight months prison sentence. He's, he's obviously paid some people to get away lately and he's, he's put the rap onto his, his manager, so he's the one who is, he requires some favours from his boss when he gets out. Um, but why is all this happening? I mean, this, it, it's nonsense. You go into Twipra, it's peatland, it's huge carbon amount, uh, you chop it down, you evict the local people from their land because they've always been there, you deplete the water sources for everybody, you destroy the fisheries, freshwater fisheries in this peatland, which is the main protein source for the local people, and you kill all the orangutans and the tigers and rhino and bears and everything else that lives there. <coughs> Why? What's more than that is Twipper is on the coast. It's only a, a meter or two above sea level. Now, when you, when you want to grow palm oil on peatlands, you have to drain it by about a meter. And so all of a sudden, all this is exposed to the atmosphere, it oxidizes, and it releases the atmosphere as CO2. And then the land itself subsides. It goes down about 2.5 meters on average in the first 25 years. So potentially after one cross of palm oil, one cycle, 25 year cycle, the whole area can be under the sea. Now you can't argue with me that that's in the interest of economic development at any level. Makes absolutely no sense. The problem is, is that people driving it, they don't live there, may not have even, ever even been there. They're already multi-billionaires in many cases living in Jakarta with houses in Singapore. And that's the problem. There's no connection and there's no accountability for a lot of these people. <laughs> now, if that wasn't tough enough, Tripa, whilst we were doing all this, there were elections in Aceh province, and a new government came into the province. 
and it turns out to be the military wing of the old Secretary Stevens. The previous governor was a smart guy. He knew that chopping down that place forest was dangerous, not just for the orangutans, but for people too. It's really steep terrain. You chop it down, you have flash floods and landslides on a regular basis. Hundreds of people get killed in Africa every year for just that. And but the, the new government's gone in there and deliberately set out to dissolve the local ecosystem and open up all those forests for exploitation. And they produced a spatial plan. It doesn't even mention the existence of the local ecosystem. Not at all. Even though it's required, its protection is required in national law, and its protection is also obliged from the Africa government under its own special autonomy law after the peace treaty. So they really just ignore it and try to make it go away. So we are faced with a situation now where if we don't do something about this, we potentially go from the scenario on the left to the scenario on the right. And it could be in as little as three and four years. A lot of this forest clearance is also due to roads, roads which currently exist. They've already come, but they're illegal at the moment. So we could challenge them in the court. But once this spatial plan is done and dusted, it would be very difficult to challenge even these roads. And, and they just fragmented the forest and fragment orangutan populations to the point where they're no longer viable. And it also opens up a lot of conflict, a lot of new conflict with elephant populations in that area, and the elephants are going to get poisoned and killed. And hunters are going to have improved access to ones looking for the rhinos up in the hills as well. So it's not just the orangutans, it's all these iconic species. Just to prove the point, all that blue stuff up there is where the elephants live. the area that's going to be trashed first. So elephants, I think we realistically, I, I predict that we could realistically lose the Sumatran rhino forever within two or three years. We could realistically lose the Sumatran elephant in five to ten. And we would probably have a few hundred orangutans hanging around in here if they were here maybe, uh, and tigers as well in about ten to fifteen years. And that will be extremely vulnerable to extinction by then. So so whether we have these species on, on the face of the planet is basically dependent on things that are going on right now in Jakarta and Banda Aceh, right now. And as I said, it's not just the animals that suffer, the people too. Hundreds of people die every year in Aceh due to flash floods, uh, which destroy entire villages. You see that on the top right there? That was a village, the same on the bottom left. Gone. It's not just a, a flood that damages somebody's rice paddy and, and, and you have to spend some more money. It wipes out the whole town and hundreds of people get killed. And these, in some areas, are, say, 30-year natural events, even in areas with good tree cover on their, on their water source. But by doing what they want to do, these 30-year events are going to be annual events, and hundreds more people are going to lose their lives as a result of this. Now, are we, are we correct that this is what the actual government wants? Are we sure they really want to dissolve the Lothar ecosystem and, dis and do all this destruction? And, well. Yeah, I mean, the, this local ecosystem needs to be protected in their spatial planning law. But then, in February, the governor himself signed a new law instructing companies how to apply for concessions within the local ecosystem. So it's crystal clear that that's what they want to do. They want to open it up, trash it, open it up for plantations, new mining concessions, legalize all these road projects. Most of the roads don't really go anywhere important, but they don't care because the whole process the whole purpose of building a road is to pocket 30% of the expenses. So you don't, the more roads that go nowhere, the better. The more roads that are poorly built and then, and then crack and break within six months after construction, the better, because then you can pocket more money again. Right? It's, it's all about embezzling money on, on projects, projects they call it. Indonesians are always building things for no obvious reason, just so they can pocket 10% of the budget. So that law itself will open up all these red areas uh, and already has opened up all these red areas. And we're, still in, we're seeing now things are starting to happen. The roads are going across the Cinco Estates further south and everybody's starting to get very, very concerned about what's going on. To get on a slightly happier note, if that's possible, uh, I just wanted to show you another project that we've been working on and I'm trying to socialise on this trip and obviously raise funds and awareness about. So it's called Orangutan Haven. We have over the last 14 years, we've got four orangutans that we will never be able to release to the forest. Um, currently they live in these metal cages, but orangutans live for 40, 50 years, and we don't want them living 40, 50 years in these metal cages. So we're looking for another option. 
we've come up with a, these are the an animals. This is on the left, there's Deknong there. She's got a chronic arthritic condition, which is almost certainly never cure. Uh, Tila on the right has a, is a carrier of human hepatitis B, otherwise shows no symptoms, but because she's a carrier, we're not supposed to release her. And then Losa is a, a handsome male orangutan who's shot 62 times with an air rifle, still has two pellets in one eye and one in the other, so he's, he's completely blind. That's him on the, on the left. Incidentally, he's also the father of twins. Yeah? We had a female orangutan who was blind as well, called Goba, and we decided that her quality of life was going to be much better if, if she had an infant to look after. But they surprised us by producing twins. Now, in 25 years with orangutans, I've heard of about eight or nine cases of twins, but these are the only orangutan twins in the world whose parents are both blind. Fortunately for Goba and the twins, we were able to do cataract surgery, so she now has her vision back and is able to be out in the forest again, so we plan to release her with the twins later this year, if not very early next year in Guangzhou. So the, the, the orangutan haven concept is to provide these animals with naturalistic environments where they've got grass and wind in their hair and a much better quality of life than they would have in the cages. We have some land now. We have 48 hectares, which is pretty big, uh, Agro Forest land, mixed Agro Forest, and we're starting to think about developing that now. Um, it's right, it's only 30 minutes from the, the city of Medan, which is like around 3 million people, something like that. And almost all of the big mining companies, plantation companies, are owned or directed or managed by people living in Medan, the, the Medan middle classes and, and above. And so we really want to use this facility to get people out of Medan into a place where they can see orangutans and learn about the environment and everything else and start connecting the dots and putting two and two together to try and just make them realize that it's the decisions that they, they take in their office on a daily basis that is really solving the, the problem. And you know, a, a unique kind of environment where they would be able to go there and see an orangutan and say, well, why can't he be released? And say, well, he's blind. You know, why is he blind? Well, he's shot 62 times with an air rifle. Oh, yeah? Does that happen? Well, yeah, it does. He's there right now. Here's the x-ray. Oh my God, so it's not just something I read about in the newspaper, it's real. And why can't this orangutan be released? Well, that's Tila. She, she's got a human hepatitis B. What, monkeys can carry human diseases? Yes, they can, you know? And, and just try and use this facility for that kind of work. Uh, but it, because it's so big, we've got a lot of new ideas as well. We want you know, organic farming schools and training programs, you know, education and scientific research as well on some of the, the fauna and flora and other aspects of the site. And, and, and it's a very ambitious project. It's going to be an expensive one, and it's going to take us quite a long time to develop too. But we are there about to start. So nice growing. There's also a lot of wildlife trade in that area, and, and especially with things like fruit bats and slow loris. So the people who buy these tend to be the middle classes and again, and, and they've, never w they've never seen a fruit bat anywhere other than a cage at the side of the road being sold as asthma medicine. And so another thing we want to do at this site is get some of these fruit bats up in the trees in netted enclosures so people can go there and see and learn about. These fruit bats are, are traded by the thousands every year and they're just sold as curry and people think they're curing asthma. Whereas they're highly intelligent animals. They're closer to primates than anything else. And they have complex social systems. And somebody even radio tracked these fruit bats in Malaysia, sleeping in Malaysia, that are flying over the Malacca Straits every night to feed in Sumatra. They're a crazy animal, and yet people are eating them on a daily basis by the hundreds. So we want to do something about that. Where are we now? There you go. As I was saying, one of the, the main reasons why we have had the successes we've had in, in Trupa, and why we still haven't given up on dealing with the spatial plan, we're, we're working now uh, with European Union governments and Scandinavian governments to try and lobby the Aceh government to completely re review the spatial plan based on good science, based on proper environmental sensitivity analysis and everything else, and based on the national law, which it doesn't do yet. So we haven't given up on that. Uh, we have achieved some things, but mostly just because of this public pressure. I mean, I, I'm a zookeeper. I didn't know anything about international campaigns in media until a couple of years ago now, but I've learned a great deal from my colleagues and everything else, and just what is possible. And I saw this, uh, this saying, this little quote there, which I thought really resonates. Yeah? I, 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 I like that, and I wanted to put it up there. And just to prove a point, myself and, and a couple of colleagues, we also climbed Kilimanjaro just a few weeks ago, and the main aim with that was to raise awareness of orangutans and fun, but 
to, to make a little documentary and raise awareness of climate change because the, the glacial summit of Kilimanjaro is predicted to be gone within as little as five or six years. So climate change is real and you can see it with your own eyes in places like this. And just to show that <coughs> how these petitions work a little bit, we, we launched another petition a while back and we got 1.3 million signatures within a matter of a few weeks. And every, like I say, every time somebody signs one of these, emails go to these key people with these key messages and they start to get really fed up and they start to pick up the telephone and do something. So these things do make a difference, they do work. At least for now. I mean, in five years' time, there's going to be some mechanism that counters them or, or whatever. But uh, at the moment, they do work. And I just thought I'd come back before I finish to Cluett's mum, Gina. And she, the zoos are always saying, oh, these are ambassadors to their species in the wild, and because they're here, we're able to do other things and everything else. Well, I was sat there thinking, Gina died the other day. And what have they really achieved in the time that she was in Jersey Zoo? Not much. The orangutan has never been as threatened as they are today. So I think we've done her a disservice. That's what I feel. I feel pretty bad. Although she did have a very good quality of life, and she did have a very safe environment. She wasn't worried about being shot down and beaten to death and clubbed uh, or have pet lids on her and burnt alive. She had a, a, a much nicer and safer life than that. And I, again, I'm going to stress this, yeah? And I like this slide anyway, so I'll, just, I'll put it in no matter what. But ultimately, the survival of these guys and the tigers and the rhinos and elephants depends on you and people like you and everybody else and me. And if there's any Americans in the audience, it depends on you. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw this as well, which made me think a little bit, so I thought I'd put it in. <coughs> but I remember when this was taken years ago, and then forgot about it. And then I saw it somewhere, this pale blue dot. Carl Sagan asked NASA to turn the camera around uh, and take a photograph before Voyager 1 left the solar system. And that's planet Earth there. So he, he made this long speech about how all of human history and all literature and all music and all everything and all evolution, whatever, it all took place on this little tiny little blue dot. And I thought, well, wouldn't it make sense to look after the thing, yeah? So with that, I say thank you very much. Um, there's some of our contact details, but I also have Ian Chambers and Facebook and Twitter accounts and everything else. But if you can get to one of these, you'll find me, no, 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 no problem. Um, that's what I was going to say now. I was going to hand over to Lucy, who was going to say a few things um, uh, about other ways you can get involved and, and what we in RAW and Earth for Orangutans have been doing. Uh, and then I'd be more than happy to answer, answer questions. Thank you very much. before um, there's a lot of uh, different uh, opportunities that come up to, to get involved with.